Welcome to Douglas Wilson's The Plotcast. As we mentioned last week, it is November. That means it's no quarter November over at DougWills.com. Additionally, Doug has released Ecochondriacs, which he is releasing chapters of on blog and Mayblog at DougWills.com. You can pre order that book at CanonPress.com. <laughs> So welcome to the Plotcast. This is episode 167. If you were looking for the Plotcast hosted by Douglas Wilson, that's me, and you were looking for Plotcast 167, you've come to the right place. So the thing I want to talk about is, well, I want to mention something by way of setting the stage and then go off in another direction that is inspired by the first comment. Pope Francis is a leftist. The Pope is a commie and periodically says things that indicate that his understanding of economics is extremely shallow and driven by sentiment and emotion and very much in tune with the sentiments of the left. So, just to reduce it down to a simple statement, the Pope is a commie. That's the presenting problem. The Pope is talking periodically, out in public, says things that are economically nonsensical. He'll just pop off with something and and want good, uh, happy thoughts or good feelings to be all that's necessary to feed the hungry. There's your problem. The Roman Catholics who are most likely to identify this uh, unfortunate trait in Pope Francis are also the um, Catholics who are most likely to be very conservative and therefore most dedicated or most committed to the notion of papal infallibility. Now, uh, we have to make a distinction right away. The doctrine of papal infallibility is not a doctrine that says every pope, every time he says anything, is always guarded against error. If the pope came inside and said it's starting to rain and he was mistaken and it wasn't, that is not a challenge um, to the doctrine of papal infallibility. If the pope sat down to do a math, uh, fill out a math quiz, Uh, The doctrine of papal infallibility does not require that he get every math question correct. The doctrine of papal infallibility says that the Pope is guaranteed against error when he is speaking ex cathedra from the throne, from the chair. So when um, when he puts on his official infallibility hat and he speaks in that mode, then that is guaranteed against error. The problem with this is we don't have a a list of all the infallible pronouncements that have been made down through history by the popes. Uh, In other words, nobody's, nobody's indexed this thing. Protestants have an ultimate word, just like the Catholics do, but we were thoughtful enough to point out what the boundaries and limits of that ultimate word might be. In other words, if someone says, what is uh, what is your ultimate final authority? What is your ultimate infallible authority? I would say the Holy Scriptures, uh, the 66 books of the Bible. And they'd say, and where, where is that? And I could point to a book on my shelf, and I could take that book down, and I could open to the front of it, and I could point to the table of contents. I could say, this book, Genesis, begins it. This book, Malachi, ends the Old Covenant. This book, Matthew, begins the New Covenant, the, the New Testament uh, teaching. And then so on to Revelation. So I can say, these are, these are my commitments. I'm, I'm telling you where my ultimate commitments are, and I'm willing to specify what they are. I'm not just giving you my ultimate, uh, you know, I, I don't want to say, well, my ultimate commitments are the word of God that he spoke to a prophet deep in the forest, and that prophet subsequently died. In other words, a word, a word that's not specified isn't any good to anybody, right? So when Protestants point to the scriptures, they've got boundaries. There's a, you know, there's an X on the map that says you are here. Or when you're, if you're driving across the country and you come to a boundary and you're leaving Montana and entering Idaho. Well, the problem with the doctrine of papal infallibility is that we don't have a table of contents for all the infallible pronouncements. A conservative Catholic 
uh, doesn't have to defend the apparent errors in the infallible statements because nobody quite knows what those infallible statements are supposed to be. That being the case, then what's to prevent uh, someone 200 years from now saying that when Pope Francis is talking economic nonsense, that those things that he's saying, well, yeah, they, yeah those things were ex cathedra. What, what is it that is the identifying marker when the Pope is speaking ex cathedra? So, in the abstract, there's no problem with the Pope talking nonsense economically. If we knew that whenever he is um, holding up two fingers, we need not believe, we can, we can feel free to disagree with him. But if he's holding up three fingers, if I'm a faithful Roman Catholic, I'm bound, bound to accept what he said. Well, but we don't have anything like that. So I think it's far better for us to um, remember that Protestant leaders are fully capable of talking economic nonsense also, but we don't have the same confusions about how much that obligates us. So we continue on with uh, Plodcast, episode 167. And as we continue our amateur careers as hamartiologists, we are getting to the point where we can handle two related words at once. I think you can do it. The first is biazzo and is the verb that is rendered as suffereth violence in Matthew eleven twelve. And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence. There it is. And the violent take it by force. Biastes is the other word in this verse, and it is the word under the rendering violent. So, the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, and the violent take it by force. So, the kingdom of God is biazzoed, and this is done by the biastes, the violent. So, the biastes, the violent, cause the kingdom of God to suffer violence. There's a parallel passage in Luke, and there, biazzo is translated as active, not passive. In Matthew, it's the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, like it's the recipient of uh, that action. In Luke, it's translated as active. The law and the prophets were until John. Since that time, the kingdom of God is preached, and every man presseth into it. Right, so, every man presseth into it. In Matthew, it says, the violent take it by force, and here it says, every man presseth into it. That's Luke 16. Now, this is one of the Lord's sayings that has to be regarded as cryptic. Are these violent ones good guys or bad guys? Is the Lord commending an impetuous seizing of the kingdom with a kind of holy impatience? Or is he predicting that bad men will arise and do bad things to the kingdom, kind of like the birds in the parable of the sower and perhaps in the parable of the mustard seed? You remember where the birds come and roost in the branches of the mustard seed. If the mustard seed, if the kingdom of God is a uh, is like a mustard seed growing up into a huge garden plant, so, so big that birds can come and nest in the branches, and Jesus points out that they do so, is that just a wonderful agrarian pastoral scene, a look at the beautiful birds nesting in the branches? Or are the birds uh, the same as they are in the parable of the sower, where they represent the devil and his agents, where the birds take the seed away in the parable of the sower? And the birds are corruptions that enter into the church once the church is established. Uh, and so you can go back to Matthew 11 and go back to Luke 16 and take th those passages either way. In other words, the violent are bad guys who are bringing their corruptions into the church, which, when you look at the history of the church, did in fact happen. Or we can say that there's some people who are so eager for salvation that they press hunger and thirst for righteousness, and Jesus promises that they will be filled, right? So either way we take it, there's wisdom for us, but only one of the ways would be hamartiology proper. God. So we're continuing on with podcast episode 167. The book I'd like to talk about uh, during this book review section is uh, Heretics by G.K. Chesterton. Uh, Heretics was a book I read years ago, uh, actually decades ago, a long time ago, and I, I recently uh, decided to listen to it. I get a lot of reading done by means of Audible as I, uh, in three-minute pieces going around town, and I just recently finished listening to Heretics again. Now, Chesterton, and this is one of those things where Chesterton is... Um, is at his best. 
what he does is um, in this book is he has a number of, you might call them sketches, of some of his contemporaries. And he talks about the basically the problems, the, the heresies that were embedded in their outlook, in their world and life view. Uh, so you might think, well, these guys are, the guys he's interacting with are dead and gone. Yes, they are. And they're not even uh, major figures in the same way that they once were. Yes, that's true also. But it's really striking. It struck me again how perennial Chesterton is, how perennially wise uh, Chesterton is. He uh, treats uh, George Bernard Shaw, who was a friend of Chesterton's and a debating partner. He ta- ta- addresses Shaw. He has a chapter on Rudyard Kipling, for example. He has a chapter on H.G. Wells. He has, a, you know, so he's interacting with these popular figures at the time. And his usual Chestertonian custom of looking at everything upside down or at least sideways is very much in evidence. Here's a recent thing that, that I got from Chesterton that is a striking example of this. He argues that, um, that people are much more provincial. If they're urbanites, if they live in big cities, they're much more provincial and limited. Uh, and if they live in villages, they are much more cosmopolitan and broad-minded. And you uh, say, well, what kind of sense does that make? If you live in a thriving, teeming urban center, why would you be more provincial than if you lived in a little village just out in the, out in the hinterlands? But Chesterton's reason for this when once he points it out, is compelling. He says, in a big city, which is affluent and busy and everybody going every which way, in a big city, you pick your friends. You pick your set. You pick those people that you hang out with. And there's, there are enough people just like you for you to pick from. You can find the church or the club or the, or the uh, organization that attracts people like you and then you find yourself hanging out with people who fit that category. In short, in the city, you pick your neighbors. In the city, you pick your friends. Uh, and Chesterton then says, in the village, God picks your friends. You know, God, God picks your neighbors. They're assigned to you. And that means you have to figure out how to get along with all sorts. And he uses the vivid image of uh, if you were doing your own self-selecting um, process, uh, that, would be, that would result in a certain state of affairs as opposed to uh, individuals being jop- dropped down the chimneys of random houses throughout the village. And then he says, but being dropped down the chimney is exactly how we all came into our families. <laughs> that's, that's what actually happens. We are assigned our families. We're not up in heaven filling out application forms of what sorts of uh, families we would find suitable. We are just assigned to one. We're dropped down the chimney. Anyway, heretics, Chesterton is alive, vibrant. His wisdom crackles. It's just very, very good. So basically, if you want to read everything Chesterton ever wrote, then there's a way of doing that. Of course, there's the collected works of Chesterton. But if you're going, if you're just don't have the time for that, but you want to appreciate him. I'd, I'd recommend Orthodoxy. I'd recommend The Everla- Everlasting Man. And I'd recommend uh, What's Wrong with the World. And I'd recommend this book, Heretics by Chesterton. Mm-hmm.